Hello, and welcome to Quintet's webinar for a richer planet, carbon reduction, and the role that humans must play. My name is James Bissell. I am Quintet's Head of Sustainable Investing, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion. Today, we're going to explore the ways in which we can secure the future of our planet, and in particular, what we can do to transform, reduce, and remove carbon from our atmosphere. I am very fortunate to be joined by five fantastic panelists who each have a specialist knowledge and area of expertise. First up, we have Josie Stoker. She is co-founder of Capture. It's a first of its kind mobile app, which allows users to monitor, reduce, and offset their carbon footprint. Alok Jha is a science and technology correspondent for The Economist news publication. He's also a broadcaster and an author. Olaf van der Veen is the CEO and co-founder of Orbisk, a fully automated waste monitoring system which empowers people to identify and reduce food waste in the hospitality sector. Fourth is Tom Savagar. He is the founder of Avancere and co-founder of the Future Laboratory and partner at the Society Lab. He consults businesses on future fitting and shifting to more a sustainable economy. And last but certainly not least is Peggy Liu. She is one of the leading catalysts of a green China, consulting companies and governments on sustainability. She's also the chairperson of JUICE, an environmental organization that's been at the heart of the greening of China since 2007. Welcome, everyone. We'll start with some questions to our panelists, and we want to hear their views on how we can change the future. Let's start with Alok. Alok, how much damage to the climate system has the mass release of carbon emissions already done in your opinion? Where are the most affected areas? So let's look at some facts. Uh, since the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century, so for the past 150 years, we've been releasing more and more carbon into the atmosphere. The World Meteorological Organization estimates something like 375 billion tons of carbon have been emitted by humans in that time. And um, it's kind of a, a, a geometric curve, you know, it keeps going up and up and up. Um, this means things like um, ice uh, can't form in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. Um, it means that weather systems change. Uh, it causes flooding in some places, it drying in others. Um, it's quite a volatile situation. And we've seen just the last few years, hurricanes uh, seasons have increased. We've seen um, places around England, let's say, uh, flooding more. Um, it, you know, it depends where you are uh, as to what the impacts are. It, it has impacts on crops. Um, it has impacts on the ability of people to make a living where they are. And so you see mass migrations. I mean, there's a huge number of things that climate change is at the back of. Um, and we can go into more of that um, in, in detail uh, as you like later. Thank you very much. Joseph, how do you think that our individual and collective behavior changes when our ability to take what is a bit of an invisible uh, element and make it more tangible and visible, how does that change our behavior both individual and collectively? So it's a mixed bag. Um, we know that consumers are still making sense of CO2 labeling itself. What we've seen is that like with nutritional labeling, um, we need to know that these that this data needs to go along hand with uh, with goals and guidelines for people too. Um, but there's another level of complexity there as well. So and that's the role that social pressure plays when it comes to individual choices and sustainability too. Um, there are loads of studies on this. A really nice one was in 2005 from the Journal of Environmental Psychology, and it found that telling shoppers that other people were buying eco-friendly products led to a 65% increase in them making at least one sustainable purchase. So there are a few things going on there, both in terms of labeling with information that needs to come with guidelines, but also knowing that other people are, are doing it as well. That's fascinating. So it's not just a case of adding the labeling, it's also this peer effect that can make uh, an individual's actions actually trigger behavioral change in others. So I want to bring Olaf in here and talk a little bit more about your area of expertise in relation to the food value chain. In what ways does food waste contribute to greenhouse gas emissions? 
So food, food production in general would be uh, one of the, the major emitter, uh, emitters of CO2 uh, uh, gases, which next to, for instance, the energy sector. So something like 24% of all global CO2 emissions are to be allocated to, uh, to food per se. And then consider the fact that we throw away, we lose along the way, something like a third. Meaning one third out of 24% is 8% of global CO2 emissions are explicitly uh, connected to food being lost along the chain. Uh, and I'm not even talking about other environmental factors like the water use, the land use, and uh, the, um, uh, the nutrients that go into that food. But just looking at CO2 emissions, we're talking 8% for food, uh, which is, to me, one of the easiest to address. I'd actually add, right. would like to add something to Olaf, if that's okay. Olaf is a hero. He's working on the single intervention that all of us can do very easily to save the planet and for the future of well, our well-being, but also for our children. So just reducing food waste is the number three solution for the drawdown list of interventions that we can all take easily every day in our kitchen, in restaurants, when we think about what we're shopping at the grocery store. So thank you so much, Olaf, for what you're doing in the world. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah. Absolutely. I want to bring Tom in here. So, Tom, can you give us a few other examples of whether it's competitive or regenerative business models that are really changing the world that we live in when it comes to climate and when it comes to carbon? Yeah. Um, no, th thank you, Olaf, because I think you, you've identified a very you know systemic intervention point there, which is which is very important. And I think this is where the ability to have that intervention understanding is critical. Um, you know, I, I do believe that organizations will survive and thrive by, by being regenerative, but it's not a very easy word to say, let alone do. Um, and in my view, it's about bringing new and vigorous life to people and planet and profit, and in, in that specific order. Um, on a various sort of like uh, models, I think the majority of businesses today are still surviving by thinking about what they can do to eliminate their own actions. The real regenerative move, however, is to be generous. And I think that shift towards not just doing something for yourself, but in, you know, in uplifting the entire value chain that you belong to. So thinking about the way in which you look at a value chain, uh, the way in which your business model encompasses the suppliers and the vendors that work with you, but also ultimately the consumers and the employees, as opposed to almost safeguarding and removing all negative actions, it's about uplifting and amplifying the positive impact. Now that requires a, a huge shift in terms of capitalism and a, a fundamental rethink in terms of what business success looked like. I think that makes a huge amount of sense, Tom. Um, in, in, in our time of terminology, for me, that is changing things from reduce and really aiming for transform. So if that's what the next 10 years look like, maybe, Peggy, I can ask you a question about how has the vision of sustainable prosperity evolved over the last 10 years? Where have we come from and what's improved today in the general mindset of people? I moved to China in 2004 from the US, and one of the things that was most striking, the differences between then and now, is the quality of the air. In 2004, the air was literally gray. Kids were not used to a blue sky. So when they would leave China for vacation, they were like, mom, what is a blue sky? Today, I have asthma from living in China for so many years in pollution, even with air filters in every room. However, today in Shanghai, I have blue sky a lot, almost every day. Now, if you compare that with the UK or America where the Industrial Revolution began, the difference in 10 years that we've made in China is phenomenal. So I would say that sustainable prosperity for me is the ability to have a dream that not, not only can we survive, and not only can, you know, it's about moving from survivability, right, to livability, but then to thriveability. So that's what I would say the real goal is for all of us in thinking about this word sustainable, moving the bar to prosperity. Thank you very much, Peggy. Very, very insightful. So let's talk a little bit about misconceptions. And I'm sure lots of people have different ideas of how we can change the global economy in relation to carbon and climate. 
I want to start with you, Olaf, which is where does most of the food waste take place? Where does that really happen in both the emerging markets and, of course, the developed markets? Yeah, it's, it's good that you refer to those two markets because it indeed depends on what part of the world you look at because food waste is very closely related in its habits to the, the welfare of a country. Um, so if you look at Africa, for instance, the poorest continent in the world, hardly anything goes to waste end of chain, whereas the richest countries in the world have the highest food waste. But let's let's focus indeed on the Western market, for the Western world for now. Um, indeed, most food waste happens end of chain. By far the largest loser, so to say, is, is a consumer. But then also a, a big chunk of that, so about, uh, about 15% out of the, the total 33% lost is lost at consumers and about 5% is lost in restaurants and the rest is lost in uh, the, the, the remaining 13% is lost in supermarkets and in uh, the, the whole chain. Josie, I'd love to bring you in here. What are the common misconceptions around carbon reduction in general? Yes, so, so I would say from, from an individual's perspective, I think there's still a bit of a, a misconception that, you know, lower carbon choices come with a compromise. Um, and it's almost like you can draw similar analogies around eating healthier food. So that kind of, you know, misconception that a lot of us had traditionally, that healthy food doesn't taste good, and that it's a, it's a compromise to eat healthier. Now, of course, in some cases, that, that may be true. Um, but but in coming back to, to compromises, um, and, and carbon reductions, I mean, you know, people aren't just sort of worried about it's a compromise in terms of quality obviously people can get that wrong but it could be the misconception that choosing an option that reduces carbon is more expensive as well um, and that's certainly something that we see a lot with with sustainable fashion so some sustainable options when it comes to clothing are, are definitely more expensive but um, the most sustainable choice of clothing is the one that you already have so it's from your existing wardrobe um, and there's definitely a huge amount of opportunities to sort of save more money um, by buying more sustainable uh, lower carbon options there as well. Ah, look, maybe I can turn to you. And when I think about climate volatility, the, the things that come to my mind are extreme temperatures, droughts, sea level rise, uh, species extinction and biodiversity risk. How did these compare to what you believe and what your research has shown us in terms of the most impacted areas for climate volatility? Well, actually, all of the things you mentioned are pretty big things. Um, biodiversity loss, um, sea level rise, um, increased weather, uh, all of that, all of, all of those things are, yeah, you know, really, really uh, important things. But of course, at the human level, uh, all of those things manifest themselves in particular ways to us. Um, so, you know, the fact that, for example, we can't, some places in the world will have their crops destroyed because there's there's not enough water or, or there's too much heat or not enough heat. You know, that that's very important because we can't just move uh, in, entire crop systems from one place to another. Countries can't move their borders when the climate in their country to changes and they can't produce their food or, or, or provide enough water for their manufacturing or those sorts of things. You know, so human society is built around the current climate. And because we've changed the climate so much, uh, people have to move to other places and unfortunately that causes tensions potentially conflict um, which we're seeing already um, and it means that um, actually the the, the the society and the civilization that we've built for thousands of years doesn't really is not really suitable for the earth that we're living on anymore all, however um, the, I think that what's really important and especially for an audience like this is to consider the economic and the sort of the business part of all of this which is that it's economics and business which will provide us the incentives to move anywhere else as in in terms of the way we live our lives and and and, and continue uh, our, our existence and so um it might be very well to sort of count all these problems and risks and things but we do need to think how do we move sustainably to somewhere else and that requires econ economic incentives in a way that i think is coming but hasn't been around for very long So I want to dive into this a little bit more detail because I really want to understand who are the main actors that can actually cause the change. So maybe starting with Tom, well, what can we do to influence organizations and how are corporations really key to this process? Yeah, and I have to say, I thought what Alok was saying was, was f purely fascinating with regards to national borders. I think with that, that's a very, very big meta conversation around the fact that our societies the way we live and the setup of our world now is built out of the, the almost as you say, uh, 
an old fashioned 20th century climate situation and we now have a new climate situation. I thought that was a that's a that's for a bigger conversation. But I think um, for me, you know, there, there is an upstream and a, and a downstream conversation here. Upstream, I think we all understand that it's about shifting processes, shifting to alternatives, reducing waste, improving materials. And all of that comes at a, at a P&L conversation, which is how much cost are you going to take on and, and how much profit hit are you going to make um, in the short term to make sure that we can survive and be here in the future. So that that very much the, uh, the visualization to Josie's point and the, the importance of helping leaders understand and see the scenarios that are coming because it is a risk to the bottom line, but it's also a fundamental risk to our humanity. We have to think about, do we then enact nudge theory to the nth degree and really think about motivation and reward and fundamentally educating 7 billion people to understand what they need to do to help? And I think that that upstream and downstream play, the balancing of the two, but I think it's the comprehension of the, the size of this and making it palatable, making it easy, making it digestible, but ultimately, you know, not to throw, not to create a sort of fluffy term, but we need to make it fun and sexy. So <laughs> it's got to be topical, it's got to be interesting, and it's got to be understood. Agree. Can, can I jump in on that as well? Uh, no, it's it's a very uh, a valid point that Tom's making. At some point, uh, we need to see how much loss we can take in order to solve this case. But in many cases, it's it's a bigger opportunity than it it is a loss. Uh, just looking on the on the mid already on the midterm, food waste is is an example, of course. But also when it comes to the energy sector, the more we invest into this sector, the cheaper the energy becomes. So in the short term, we will need to invest. In the midterm, it'll already turn into the opportunity that will prevent a, 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 like a huge amount of cost on the long term when everything would be degrading and we would need to be solving like global uh, climate issues. But I, I, I do sincerely see that we need to advocate more how much how big the opportunity in the midterm is. When it comes to food waste, the, uh, the uh, agricultural organization, the federal agricultural organization of the, uh, the US uh, calculated that every euro you invest in prevention of food waste comes back seven times um, in the amount of, of, of profit you can get from that in the midterm. So I think it's it's very important to elaborate not only the cost uh, of sustainability, but the opportunity in, in sustainability. So just to come in, Olaf, on what you were saying, I think this is a governance conversation as well, because from a governance perspective, usually a board is protected from risk in terms of a, a, an annual board meeting or a monthly board meeting. So the discussion from a financial perspective is currently geared towards how do we protect their assets? How do we think about the shareholder debates? and think about the way in which we we look at the risk of moving forward and making a loss versus absolutely to your point, which is the, the, the point of governing a board or governance should be about alluding to breakthrough opportunities and, and creating almost a, a risk friendliness at a board level. That's a mindset shift fundamentally that, that I too um, am very encouraged by some businesses doing that. And, um, and I'd also like to, to add on to that when it comes to a mindset shift and um, what Tom was mentioning about the need to sort of get more people involved in this and make it something fun and satisfying. I would say in general, I feel like humans, we're not very good at avoiding large disasters. And I feel like it's time for climate change and, and, and how we talk about it to be instead of avoiding something terrible, to be moving towards something that's positive instead. You know, and like Peggy was saying in terms of air quality, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if the skies were blue and clear and if, you know, we could could walk down streets and there were trees there and, and and the air that we breathed in was you know it was fresh and we had you know free energy that was renewable and so it would be great to sort of switch the conversation more towards looking at the positives and what we can all achieve by moving towards that as well yeah fantastic so let's do exactly that and talk about the future. How can we transform the world that we live in? How can we create a positive set of incentives so that everyone can be part of this transformation? Maybe I'll start with Tom. Tom, what is your vision for a new and more vigorous social, natural and economic world? And what role can each of us play in bringing this to life? Um, thank you. I think... Um so that, that, that one liner that you've described is the, um, I guess, the, the top of the mountain that I'm trying to take my clients up. So in an ideal world, um, there is an elevatory ability for an organization for themselves and the entire value chain. But it doesn't just stop there in terms of 
making sure society is elevated. It's the fact that energy is renewable and available to all. Water is responsibly sourced and available to all. Waste does not exist. Uh, we manage natural resources in a way that respects communities and animals and ecosystems. Um, the environment is free from pollution and our physical presence in the world, i.e. from a construction perspective, we protect the health of ecosystems around us. So in a, in a utopia, that would be a wonderful situation. It is a complete reversal of degenerative capitalism that we have got very used to. Um, the way we can do that is about by adopting new mindsets and, and modes of being. Um, the modes of being are usually come from a knee-jerk reaction to either, for example, a leader who is maybe ill or has had something happen in their life. They tend to, a switch flips in their mind and they grow a conscience very quickly and they reform their the, the way their business runs or the way their country is run. We need to somehow uh, create almost like a... Um, a moment where everyone understands what that flips that that switch flip feels like and actually goes into a new mode very quickly um, and there are three fundamental tenets to that one is the fact that we need to be far more allied as human beings so we need to be more together on things um, foster that sense of collaboration and cooperation we need to be more systemic and understand like Olaf what I was saying the, the fundamental system, systemic inter intervention points and that is a cerebral exercise. It's not easy to do. Um, the second big tenant is we need to be far more eager. Um, we need to be more fearless, more pioneering, more forward thinking, and really seize that concept of breakthrough versus just almost getting used to breakdown events, like Josie was saying. And then lastly, we need to be far more uplifting as human beings to each other. So amplifying each other's abilities, being more developmental as societies and encouraging each other to unlock each other's capacity and far more responsible. I think we need to understand what our responsibility is. And I don't know about you, but from a light, from the lights of a pandemic, you see a lot of irresponsible behavior. And I think when it comes to climate change, you know, the pandemic has been a bit of a dress rehearsal for what the climate change is going to actually do to us. And if one thing, if I could leave one thing, if there was, um, if I could find the PR agency that, that were hired to do the pandemic, I think we should get climate change to hire them because they were even given a logo which was fantastic. It's super exciting uh, to, to get on that train of, of change. Uh, we just need to, and it, it's super exciting to all the people in this room because we are on that train. But uh, I, I guess we need to vocate that a little bit more, how exciting this trip is that we're on. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Olaf. A really clear vision there. Maybe, Alok, I can ask you, do you share that vision around transforming, reducing and removing carbon from our atmosphere? And are there any unintended consequences that might arise from implementing zero carbon technologies and this kind of transformative uh, vision? Yeah, well, if you want to do anything about climate change, you have to do the things that uh, Tom and Olaf um, sort of outlined that, that, of course, you do. Uh, our entire societal economics needs to change. And the only way people um, respond and change their behavior is through incentives of some sort. And I think that businesses changing their practices, governments changing their practices, these are all important things for individuals to also then change their practices. But, and, um, you know, uh, I think that uh, the, the, if you talk about unintended consequences, um, I can list a few. Uh, so you know, people might think to themselves, "Okay, well, I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna uh, tra uh, travel by plane so much because you know we hear a lot about carbon emissions from planes uh, and aviation generally. I'm not gonna do that. So uh, I'm now uh, going to stay within my own country, and it means I can travel within my own country by car much more. Now, never mind the carbon emissions of a car journey as well, but the fact is that you're more likely to die in a car accident than you are in a plane. So you know your risk of death goes up actually, uh, bizarrely. You know the Economics is full of these sorts of things, and I think we should be really careful not to push people from one thing to another. Climate change is really, really important and is a life or death issue, but there's also other issues people have. For example, if you decide you're going to increase the cost of food because um, you want it to be more sustainable, which I totally wholeheartedly agree with, well, what does that do for people who are poor in your neighborhood? And can they afford the same food? Um, you know, we are humans um, in multi dimensions. And I think that just because I can do something that's climate friendly doesn't mean that someone next to me can. And we should think about how uh, solutions that work for the largest groups of people. Well, let's keep talking about being positive. Uh, Peggy, I want to bring you in here. Can you tell us more about what is the China dream and what has given China a leading edge in the race to net zero? Well, in 2010, I've 
already been an environmentalist for a while. And in China, we had worked to bring in smart grid into China to revolutionize the electrical grid. We started to teach mayors across the country how to build eco cities. We changed the light bulbs from incandescence to energy efficient lighting. But a light bulb popped into my head, uh, you know, pun intended, that we can't just work on better sources of energy, more sustainable sources of energy. We have to work on demand. So sustainability is a balance between supply and demand. So I started to look at what was going wrong? Why is it that we can't engage more people in a sustainable lifestyle? Um, and what I realized, this is the most important thing that I've really baked into all my work now since then, is, is that we are approaching, as activists, we are approaching this all wrong. People do not change their behavior when you try to make them feel guilty or when you try to overload them with facts that they don't care about. But they change their behavior when they feel loved, when they feel safe, when they feel special, when they feel like they belong, when they feel like they've found home. And so fundamentally, China Dream is about envisioning a collective, uh, amazing world that we would all want to jump into and feel this sense of love and being loved. So. We worked with advertising agencies, we worked with sustainability experts, we worked with cultural experts to remove the language speaking to people's heads to then inject the language of love. So survivability, livability, thriveability, being on a journey together. And that is the China dream. And this has fundamentally changed, I think, the entire nation's view of what it means to what it is that we're Towards. We're not working towards wind, uh, you know, wind energy turbines. We're not working towards solar panels. We're not working towards just high-speed rail. We are working towards a world where we feel safe and we're healthy, and we can connect to people who are healthy and well. And things are green. We have blue sky. Children are running around happy. Like this is the world that we all feel joyful about. So fundamentally, how do we retell the story of sustainability through the lens of prosperity? And can I just ask what, what in, in that process? Because I, I think that's fascinating when you think about West versus East with regards to the the the, the sentiment that you're that you're talking about versus uh, the way that obviously in the West we are still puzzling around. Um, my my new shy debates and not these big grand debates. If I'm honest, what was in the in those moments when the decision makers signed off the advertising campaigns? What was it that was the trigger for them to say, "Happy, I'm happy with that that sentiment"? Was it a functional benefit and return on that that advert that they could see, or was were they feeling the emotional connection? So, um, China Dream, unlike some of my other projects, which were top down. So when you have uh, electrical grid when there's only two grid companies, you can talk to two people and change the entire nation. That's literally what we did. We had $7.2 billion dedicated to smart grid within two and a half years of us talking to the right people at the right grid and surrounding them with technical solutions. However, when you're talking to people's lifestyles, behavior, what you want to do is create a global energetic momentum like a, a tornado right, going upward spiral and then gaining speed as it moves across the ground. That then what happened was we had a lot of press domestically, but then I'm going to be honest, it was a foreign journalist, Tom Friedman, who wrote about this program. He interviewed me. You can look at it. China needs its own dream. This was in October 2012. And it doesn't matter if we were in, you know, uh, any other magazine, the largest magazines or TV, etc. in China, Tom Friedman writing that article, then it was translated into Chinese. What happened was then a Chinese magazine did a whole issue cover story, the power of the China dream. And guess who stepped into office that month? Xi Jinping. And when he gave his first State of the Union, he used this term, China dream, which then became the national slogan, uh, was the number two used phrase the next year after Xi Dada, Uncle Xi, and it just swept the nation. So then the power of this, again, it's all about energetic momentum. 
everything about change, changing behavior, is about energetic momentum here, not here. Thank you very much. Super. Thank you very much to the panel here for these great insights. What we're going to do now is open the panel up to questions from our audience. Please do stay with us. Hello again and welcome back. We're now going to take your questions and put them to our panelists. The first question I have here is from Ranjit. And Ranjit says, are the current carbon reduction targets too ambitious or not ambitious enough? What does the panel think? Uh, okay, quick answer to that. Say, they're not ambitious enough at all. Of course they're not, because um, the uh, Paris Agreement is basically uh, something which says that, that people will reduce their emissions by such that they're trying to avoid two degrees of temperature rise by the end of the century, which, um, as you know, we've already had 1.5 degrees rise from the Industrial Revolution. So we've got 0 0.5 left. I just don't think that's possible. However, it's not to say that we shouldn't try. Um, we need to be much, much more ambitious and to take to, uh, much more aggressive uh, targets. Uh, and, and some countries do better than others. China's for one, one for example. Um, no, we need to be much more ambitious. I'm going to announce something that most people listening probably do not know. But Xi Jinping has just made a massive announcement that China is going to go carbon neutral by 2060. So for anybody who understands how difficult this is to just decrease the amount of carbon emissions from China, to go carbon neutral by 2060 is a phenomenal commitment. And of course, how do we know how to get there? We don't. But it's a matter of commitment and willpower and the realization that we all need to work together. All countries need to work together to basically survive, for humanity to survive. Strongly agree, strongly agree indeed. We have another question coming in. Uh, it's from Jacob, and he is asking, in what ways has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted carbon reduction goals? Who would like to jump in and lead us off on COVID-19 and the impact on carbon? So, um, so I can take that one. So if you look at CO2 emissions and, and, and what's happened this year, so if you compare the first half of 2020 to the first half of 2019, we've seen an 8.8% decrease in CO2 emissions. And that is absolutely massive. So we haven't seen a decrease in emissions like this since I think around World War II. Um, so it's huge. So that's really positive in the sense that, you know, we can do it, but also it's really negative because this has been a, a horrendous global pandemic. So you can, you can look at the pros and cons there, but that's the effect that it's had. Obviously, it's a little bit difficult to say what will happen when people bounce back and obviously the hope is that we can bounce back greener um, than we were before. Can I make one tiny point here which is that we are in a global recession as a result of this uh, pandemic and to restart the economy every government is going to have to spend a lot of money and there's a massive opportunity to spend that money in places yes. that directly address the problems we've been talking about so there's going to have we're going to have to build lots of things we're going to have to give people jobs give them jobs in the green sector give them jobs in building um uh solar solar panels these are the kind of things you can you can choose to spend money on and we're all going to have there's going to be trillions spent as in stimulus why not direct them towards more sustainable things it, it, there's no reason not to there's absolutely zero purpose in sp spending money to build a new coal-fired power station for example um you know, uh, is, you know you know we're going to spend that money anyway spend it in something which is more sustainable very clear um we have another question that's come in this question is from lucy so what is the best thing we can do as individuals to protect the future of our planet. I want to start with Olaf. I think I'm, I know what you might say, but we'll start there nevertheless. Yeah, obviously, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about food. Indeed, uh, um, um, 
uh, being more considerate about both reducing your waste, but also in the, a more plant-rich diet will uh, aid us significantly. And we are being helped as consumers nowadays. It's so much easier to be a vegetarian now than it was 30 years ago. When it comes to the amount of great foods you can you can buy just in your average supermarket that 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 fill your uh, your your meals with a lot more variety than it, than you used to be able to. But indeed, I think I think uh, Josie has one of the the major components in there when it comes to just being aware of what part of life is most impactful in what you do and reconsidering those. Uh, I, I just uh, downloaded your app, uh, Josie. Uh, I wonder. I was wondering. I ne never heard of it before. And I, even though I only, uh, I, I'm a vegetarian, but and, and I generally go by bicycle because I'm Dutch. You know, that's what we do. Um, uh, I found out I, I probably take one or two uh, uh, trips by plane uh, a year, one or two in a full year. That's my most impactful thing that I do. Um, I didn't even know that. Really, even though I'm in this industry. So um, uh, this by indeed, and that's to Tom's point before, by making it more fun, by making it more convenient, and that's to us as entrepreneurs, making it more fun and more convenient for, for consumers to, uh, uh, to become more sustainable and actually alleviate some of the things that you, you currently have by means of food, by means of apps and, and what have you. I think uh, there's that's the biggest change because because we are in the in the end we are the only impactors because we are the companies the companies work for us governments work for us so uh, it's us that 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 in the end need to change. Josie, your view? Yes, um, yeah, we definitely add on to that. I think um, thank you very much for downloading the app, and I hope it's going well. Um, so, in, in terms of individuals and, and and sort of looking at our own carbon footprints and our own behaviours, um, so two points I'd like to make. So, first point: yes, flying is 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 a massive, massive um, you know contributor to your individual carbon footprint. Um, and I recommend you check out a website called shameplane.com. Um, it does what it what what you expected to do. It shows you how much Arctic ice emissions from your flight um, causes to melt. So that's shameplane.com. So go on, go on there, check it out. Um, it's a really great way to visualize emissions. Um, but the other thing as well, sort of touching on this, it, there's like a big push pull going on between, you know, who's, whose fault is this? Is it individual's fault? Is it is it the corporation's fault? Um, Shell tweeted, what can you do to help the climate crisis? And um, that didn't go down too well. Um, and there is this big argument, which, you know, between what, what can we do and what can big companies do? But yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we choose which companies we work for we choose who we invest in we choose which governments we vote for in, you know in some cases so i think that there is quite a blurred line between individual and systemic actions so if you can do a little bit of both um, i think that's great i think we've got time for a couple more questions um, this question comes from chloe when we're thinking about carbon and climate change and the different ways that we can respond, we can transform our, our, our society and our activities. We can obviously reduce our own footprints and increasingly we can even remove carbon. So across those three dimensions, transform, reduce and remove, where is the biggest opportunity does the panel think? For me, you know, I think the word transform is really the 2020 word you know, of the year. And so the variations of that regeneration, rebirth, renew, all of that is what we need to do as humans is to really think about how we're going to not just incrementally change, but radically change our ways. You know, yesterday, my father had his 80th birthday and we we're standing around and he showed something that he dug up out of his records, his storage, which is my grandfather's 80th um, birthday autobiography. My grandfather is a Taoist grandmaster, and I didn't know that he had written several books about what the Tao is. And the first chapter basically starts saying that the Tao is basically nature. We have to go with the flow of nature. And when we try to go beyond nature or outside of nature, we're not aligned with the energy of nature that's when we get into trouble. So I would say the answer to all the questions of the webinar is how can we as humans that we are not on top of the food chain, the technology has falsely led us to believe that, 
but instead we are just one particle in a large energy field uh, of nature. So how do we realign ourselves with this flow of nature? We need to realize we're not separate from nature, we are part of nature. We need to envision the future we want versus complain about the future we don't want. So it's the quantum manifestation, right? How do we joyfully talk about a world where we all thrive? And when I say we, not just humans, but every part of nature. Mm. But I think, I think semiotically, from a, from a visual language perspective, what you're talking about there, Peggy, is, is at the heart of what I try and do with my company, my clients, is to make them realize these things. And I mentioned before that it's a sad thing that a lot of clients who have had a, the, the, the switch flipped in their minds when they get it is because something physically has happened to them or mentally, it's a mental or physical wellness, and they've been affected and they've gone, what was I thinking? The proximity to nature and the, the, the disconnection that as human beings we have had over the last hundreds of years where we have become disconnected, not so much in, in Asia, I must say, um, especially in the West and in an in industrialized West is, is fascinating because uh, my wife is Norwegian and we spend a lot of time in Norway, but Norwegians are the second most climate cynical nation in the world, which is ironic when you think about the, the claims of being highly sustainable, is because their mountains aren't thawing as quick as other parts of the world. They're not in the middle part of the planet. So the, the moment where they can't ski every year, then they'll start saying there's climate change. <laughs> so there, there's these, there are these fundamental semiotic moments where the, the, the levels or the, the amount of times they can go skiing a year, for example, in somewhere like Norway, um, means they take it seriously versus a sub-Saharan area of the world where they go, it's 42 degrees again today. So it, that, that perception of the challenge and that perception of the opportunity and the proximity to nature, um, whether or not you are in nature or not, I think is, a, is, a, is an immersion tank that we need to somehow I, ideally start with the leaders and immerse them in the reality of what will be and what it could be as, as a positive outcome. So it's, it's a very... It's a good. It's a good exam question, I think. Yeah, Tom, can I just uh, pick up on what you just said there? About I think it's really important to put uh, for people to have emotional responses to things, and I think that it's incredibly uh, useful to ha to help leaders decide that. But I feel like we can't leave it up to people's individual experiences. Is that there's not enough time <laughs> for yeah, everyone to have yeah. a transformational experience to then change their business or whatever else they're doing? I'm sure you recognise that, um, and I think that around the world people are having these experiences all the time whether it's the, yeah. losing their homes in a hurricane or you know not having food to eat um the you know people are different so i think that you know some of us do need to step back a bit and try and create systems that allow people to live relatively normal lives but which are more sustainable without having to have the lived experience thing um although i do res respect that you you can pick a group of people maybe very senior leaders to make sure they do have some sort of visceral response and i think that actually visceral responses are an incredibly important way of making people change their behavior um on the norway thing i find it really interesting actually i do think that you know on a colloquial level you find the scandinavians and norway norwegians and others generally tend to be more um uh environmentally friendly and conscious but of course norway's entire wealth is based on oil so it's the, there's a reason why they don't necessarily want to want that to stop i don't know i mean although having said that they have the most teslas in the world per person i believe so they do take yeah. it seriously as well they're a very mixed up nation so we have time for one more question uh it's coming from sergio in less than 10 words what is the most exciting technology related to climate change that you would want to invest in? Maybe, Tom, if we could lead off with you, most exciting technology that you'd want to invest in. <laughs> um, you're going to have to give me a second on this one. Maybe start with someone else. All right. <laughs> so my answer to that question is very simple. I've got two, it's just two words. Nuclear fusion. Agreed. I will have agrees. Peggy, do you have a yeah. view here? In addition to nuclear fusion, storytelling to, to make the vision of a sustainable world come alive for each and every one of us, young and old. Right, clear. Josie, uh, what is your view? What's the most exciting technology related to climate change that you would want to invest in? 
There's a really cool company called Climeworks, and they've developed technology that captures CO2 directly from the air and stores it underground. Um, we can't beat this without at some point looking at CO2 removal. Um, so that would be that would be mine. Very good. Tom, last word to you. What's the technology that you would want to invest in? As a, as a broad mechanism, I would say artificial intelligence, mainly as an accompaniment to human ability and ingenuity. So the ability to outthink the challenges and consequences of actually making any of these actions happen. Thank you very much. So unfortunately, that's all we've got time today with the Quintet webinar for a richer planet, carbon reduction and the role humans must play. I'd like to thank Peggy and Alec and Tom, Olaf and Josie for all their contributions today, as well as to our audience for spending the time with us and asking those very insightful questions. So thank you very much and have a great day.